All right, good evening and welcome to Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida. Today's topic of discussion is uh, <laughs> mental health in the African American community. Uh, we have some uh, very distinguished guests. I'm going to have them all introduce themselves and let the, let you all know what they do. So um, this is a very serious topic, and um, you're going to learn a lot tonight. And we're just going to just bring you on with some full of informative and educational information. Um, so I'm going to have each one of you in introduce yourself. And uh, we're going to go start off with uh, the licensed clinical social worker, uh, Latoya Caldwell. Introduce yourself briefly and just say, let the audience know what you do. All right. Good evening. My name is Latoya Congolo, maiden name Caldwell. So I, obviously I've known uh, Omar for quite some time. So um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, licensed clinical drug and alcohol counselor. And um, I've been in the field for going on, it'd be 25 years in September this year, um, working with a variety of people with a variety of uh, mental issues. And um, my husband and I co-own Work-Life Behavioral Health, which is an outpatient mental health and addictions clinic in Glen Burnie, Maryland. Um, also a uh, former candidate for the House of Delegates for District 31 here in uh, Maryland. So uh, I'm happy to be here and a part of this conversation. All right. Now, the I'm Day. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm going to get it right before the end of the show. You can just introduce yourself and let the audience know yeah. what you do. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nimare Bewu. Uh, and I, well, I do a lot of different things with my day job and my side jobs, but the, cap the capacity that I'm coming in tonight is as the um, Diversity and Equity Fellow with NAMI Delaware. Um, I have a fellowship with NAMI, and that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, so the main thing that I do in my role is have conversations like these, uh, where we talk about mental health in the BIPOC community, um, bringing some of the resources and knowledge that it's available at NAMI to all of you, and really just to um, help educate and help remove that stigma that's so strong in our community by having open and sometimes difficult and sometimes fun conversations. Akisha Sneed, what's going on? <laughs> Hey, um, again, my name is Patricia Speed. I'm actually a board certified family nurse practitioner. I do early work with um, our soldiers and veterans at, at this time. And mental health is one of my very, very most important passions um, out of every, every area in nursing. But also, I am a people nurse source as well. Okay, all right. And last but not least, we have the Apostle Ivory Hopkins. Apostle, go ahead and My name yourself. is Ivory Hopkins. I'm founder of Pilgrim's Ministry of Deliverance, located in Georgetown, Delaware. I have traveled the nation for about 45 years uh, teaching on the Ministry of Deliverance and Healing, but I also am author of a book called Who Counsels the Counselor, and which caused me to engage uh, leadership to get the help that they need in their mental health issues. Uh, we believe in the power of God. We believe that uh, our faith is strong, but we need to address mental health issues, amen, in a more informative way. And so I'm on a quest to try to get our leadership in churches and, and, and faith-based places to accept it, that it's okay to know that one needs mental health, know what one needs uh, uh, treatments, one needs programs, one needs counseling. It's more than just a prayer line. And I say that respectfully, but those who know church, uh, the church arena knows that this is a hard thing to tackle, especially in the black community. I want to start off by asking uh, Latoya, um, how would you define mental illness? Well, mental illness, it, it really is um, a clinical um, a description. So it really is someone who meets the criteria based on a set of symptoms uh, for certain for certain disorders. Um, so they would need to be assessed to be diagnosed um, and then determined if they meet a certain um, criteria for mental illness. So it really isn't something that, you know, a lot of people throw around the, the um, terms, oh, my boyfriend's narcissistic or I think I'm bipolar. It really takes a set of clinical symptoms for a person to be diagnosed and assessed uh, for, for a certain disorder. 
All right, and so you use the word symptoms. So I'm gonna throw this question in the air for anyone of you who wanna address it. What are some of the signs and symptoms of someone who may be struggling with mental illness? Because sometimes people may struggle with some of the signs and may not know that they're struggling with the signs. They may, they may not know that they're depressed and they need to see someone. They may not know that they're overly stressed. They may not know that um, they have delusional or paranoid thoughts. So yeah, let's, let's, let's get into what are some of the signs and symptoms of mental illness. Anybody can tackle that question if they may. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll... okay. Go ahead, Lakeisha. Oh, go, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say, um, just kind of um, some of the things of um, for more than two weeks, if you're feeling helpless, you're feeling hopeless, down, depressed, even if you lost interest or pleasure in doing the things that you really enjoy and love doing, for the most part, um, isolation. Some some may even have where they struggle with concentration. Um, they may even what we call alter, have altered mental status um, to the point where they can be delusional or have hallucinations, meaning that they're seeing or hearing things that physically is not there, but in their mind, it is there and it is real. Um, it's organized thoughts um, along the line and the standpoint of just not being able to verbally communicate, mismatching words that are normal in normal sentences that just won't make sense. But a lot of rambling, rambling is what we would say. Um, it's so much, and like Latoya was saying, it's many techniques, and it takes time and assessment to really truly assess these things and watching and monitoring behaviors to as well. Um, we sometimes don't watch our people, you know. If you know someone normally is jovial, outgoing, and then all of a sudden one day they are not answering the phone. They're no longer jo jovial. They're no longer smiling like they should. Or either they may smile inappropriately at certain times that's not a problem. If somebody is sick, you know, or someone is shot, normally don't laugh about that but someone that may exhibit certain signs for certain mental conditions can exhibit a lot of inappropriate behaviors on down to stripping their clothes off in public. So it's, it's a lot, it's a lot, and it's something that definitely needs to be discussed in the minority culture as a whole, even with us and in the African American community, we're told what goes on in this house stays. Mm -hmm. You know, and these are definitely things that need to be discussed. Um, right. I wanted to add. Oh, sorry. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, just Go ahead. to add a little bit onto that, um, because like like she said, like um, Lakeisha and Latoya said, it's so much, right? There's so many different types of mental illnesses and mental health things, and. Um, and one that we're more familiar with that we see a lot more is like depression and anxiety. So, you know, those are some really great um, tips of things to look for in someone because we will see those most often. Um, I would also say, though, like the biggest thing to keep an eye for an eye out is like if those certain behaviors impact your day to day life and have like it hinders it in any way, you know, kind of like Latoya was saying, like we throw around words like narcissistic OCD, but like you know, do you like your pens in a certain order? Or like, can you not leave your house unless your pens are in a certain order? Like that's the difference between like, I like things orderly and I have OCD. So a lot of times, even like with depression and things like that, we all experience hardships. We all go through tough times in life. So having times and periods where you're down, where you don't want to communicate, things like that, it's going to happen. But where you need to start being concerned either for yourself or a loved one is when it's prolonged when it's for a longer period of time and when it starts to impact your day-to-day -day life because you're so down, you can't do your normal activities or you have such anxiety, you can't leave the house, things like that. You know, uh, Apostle, sometimes you may have an individual who's uh, exceeded in high school, 
played in the all-star, all-state basketball, football player, excellent grades, went to college, graduated, got a degree in business administration. Then all of a sudden, uh, he or she becomes, well, he becomes uh, diagnosed with a mental illness. And sometimes uh, life stressors can lead uh, to, to a mental illness. Uh, so can, can you give us some examples of, um, because, because here, here's, here's the thing. You have those who look back at their, their childhood and say, man, so-and-so was an all-state basketball player. So-and-so had it together. So-and-so was on his way to, to start him. And then mental illness hit. Man, and how, how, how did it get like that? Well, one, one of the things I, I would say is that when a person has got an overachieving outward presence, and then you, those in their surrounding begins to tell that something is changing in them. I think uh, one of the hardest thing in a situation like that is first identification. And when I say identification, I mean, like the person, those that know them that are close to them will start recognizing a change. They may even recognize it themselves, but denial, depending on what their belief system is, can play a hard, a heavy part in them not getting the help. I, I, I will say this, not trying to take up a lot of time. One of the things I wrote in my book when I started counseling with ministers uh, who were out there really doing the work, I mean, they were grinding. And But after a while, something happened to the counselor. And when I wrote the book, Who Counsels the Counselor, it was actually written from a minister who had literally crashed and burned, fell back into the same drug addiction that he had before his conversion, which uh, which is hard to get some people to understand that. Um, addictions that recall you are not something that just goes away. They have to be acknowledged, treated, and sometimes one has to actually realize that if you get in the right dynamic of events, it can be reactivated. And so when I first met this, and I, like I said, I don't want to take a lot of time, but the other clinical workers, you guys, y'all are going to, uh, y'all deal with this more so than I do. But I said some of the warning signs and what I, what I wrote, check this out. When warning signs, when ministry, when the minister needs to be ministered to, one, when you have a hard time letting go incidents, after a while, they can't seem to let stuff go. When it dominates their thought life and, and what have you, when it becomes all they begin to talk about, the issues of the work, the issues of the church, or the issues of the job, it's the same thing, just a different name. When those who serve you see something is wrong and <laughs> wants to tell you, but it has a hard time approaching you with it. Most, there are majority of people in my understanding, before they actually get the help they need, there's a large number of them that will literally crash and burn before they will stop and get the help. So when you look at that person, they have to acknowledge it and others around them have to be there for them in such a way and letting them know it's okay to get the help you need. One of my clients now, wonderful minister, doing a lot of great work, but he's going through some mental health issues where he needs medication. And I had to talk him through that there is nothing against the anointing to need the medication and help that, to, that to help you adjust yourself. So I run into cases like that, nephew. Uh, anyway, let me back up, let somebody else talk. <laughs> right, no, I, I appreciate everything you said. And uh, I hope that we dive into the uh, counselors and parishioners who do not seek help. So, but that's probably a, that's, a later conversation or maybe a later question. Yeah, um, yeah but, but that's where it goes. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, but back to Omar's question, when we talk about the um, onset of, of mental illness and psychosis, it usually happens in late teens, early 20s. So it's not uncommon to see someone who was functional, who was maybe even successful academically, athletically um, for a, a long period of time before you actually see the psychosis. So it, it lays dormant, especially if someone has a, a genetic predisposition 
for um, mental illness and substance use disorder. So we have to take that into account. But if there's a triggering event, then that would pretty much prime them for the onset of mental illness. So I've, I've and I'll, I'll just be honest, I've had um, black families that says, well, you know, my my loved one was maybe slipped a Mickey or they, they, they smoked something or they just, mm-hmm. no, what it is uh-huh. is that, you know, maybe granddad had a, had schizophrenia or mom had bipolar disorder. Uh-huh. That's majority of the, the, the issue there is the genetic predisposition for it. And um, a lot of times we don't take that into account. We don't have those conversations. We need to look at mental illness like we do, diabetes, high blood pressure in the family, Absolutely. cancer. It's, it's just another disorder that we need to talk to our loved ones about because there are preventative measures in order to at least you know stay functional or, or stable. Excellent. You know, you know Lakeisha, um, one of the things that, 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 that I noticed you know, is working in the field is that certain periods uh, during the year, for example, you may see more uh, of the clientele going to the hospital for one reason, one reason or, or another. For example, uh, we look at November as Thanksgiving, uh, oh. December is Christmas, and, and then sometimes those, those holidays spark a trigger because the loved ones that were there when we were growing up as kids, five, 10, 15 years ago, whatever, they're no longer there. So. And some people are alone during those time periods, which may cause, you know, isolation, uh, the depression, whatever have you. So working in the ER department, do do, do you see um, the more clients, you know, be admitted uh, to the hospital for mental health conditions, maybe during the the summertime, the wintertime, springtime, the fall time, or is it just basically Mm -hmm. the same? Well, on average, you will see um, well over 
very important. Um, one of the things when I see my patients every single day, I ask them, tell me how you've been feeling the last two weeks. Have you been feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? Have you lost interest or pleasure in doing things? And once I they answer that question and open the door, then I'll start asking them about their concentration. Uh, you're having trouble concentrating, you know, tell me, are you feeling or sleeping more than normal? How's your appetite? How are you eating? These are things that has now become a part of primary care practice um, doing um, screenings that we're having to do now. Um, it used to not be done, but now it is starting to, to now be identified, mental health board now has been identified in the primary care setting, which is very interesting. But also I would say this with COVID, it has been an increase oh like oh yeah. no other related to COVID. COVID really brought out a lot of things. It really showed who was able to be by themselves and cope with being by themselves plenty of time and who was not. It really opened the door about mental health and it's frustrating for me sometimes in the healthcare setting because of the lack of sometimes resources. We don't have enough mental health providers. Um, mm -hmm. We have people who have left the profession because of COVID. You know, mm -hmm. so these are definitely conversations. I, I'm loving this conversation, you guys, and even with the resources. NUMMI is one of my most favorite. Um, actual resources. And when I first wrote my first book for these from pain to purpose, it actually gives you the details about whole the trauma, recovering from it all. It gives you the, the balance between biblical, but also the medical and the mental health standpoint. So we can be able to better um, make better decisions whether to take medication or not. And I personally will speak about mental health because I suffer I take medication. Right. I'm riding with you guys as you ride back with me from Atlanta. We just literally just finished um, planning my next week. So it's real. But you don't have to look, but you look like what you're doing. And it takes time to get there. And it does not make me less of a nurse. It does not make me less of a nurse practitioner. It does not make me less of a clinical instructor, it does not make me less of a woman of God because I take medication and I can fear. Absolutely. Right. You know, um, we, we mentioned um, uh, being alone, struggling alone. Uh, one of the things that uh, NAMI Delaware has, uh, that Naim, Naim Day, is um, support groups. So if you could talk about the significance of having a support system, because um, there are those who, for one reason or another, may be uh, uh, maybe say, let's say, kicked out the family or may not have any, any family support because they may have oh. done something in the past which resulted in their family saying, I ain't got nothing to do with you. Uh, 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 no more. You're on your own. And unfortunately, that, that happens. So there are those who struggle alone and, and they need a support system. So I want you to talk significantly about um, this, the, the significance of having a support system. And there's two, another part of that question is the significance of having uh, family support and social support as well, if anyone wants to address that. So Go ahead, Miss and Miss Allen. <clears throat> Good. Sam. Yes, support is vital. Um, a lot of times, people find even with regular life things that we have to go through. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's not the thing you're going through; it's the lack of support um, for those struggles. Like when we talk about like LGBTQIA teens, it's not that they are LGBTQ that's the struggle; it's their families kicking them out and not being acceptance of them. So having that support, whether you're dealing with something like that or mental illness, whether you think you have it, um, whether you know that you have it and you just want someone to talk to, there's something about connecting with people who have the same lived experiences, right? Um, I went through a very difficult year last year and I've learned through that year that there is a huge difference between being empathetic towards someone for something and truly understanding what they're going through. Like there were mm -hmm. things that I thought I was very empathetic towards. And then I went through and on the other side, I was like, but going through it is totally different. So having 
a support group where you can talk about that stuff is vital. And then also family and friends living with it, having that support is is super important as well um, because that's a whole nother side of it, right? Um, there's the person who is going through, whether there's depression or psychosis or different things. And then there's the people on the other side who have it impacting their life, who are dealing with a wide range of emotions that they never thought they would you know, have to deal with. And a lot of people actually deal with it. It's like one in five people at some point in their life will have a mental health or mental illness episode. So think about all the people that are connected and touching that person. Um, mm -hmm. So is, with NAMI, we do try to have not just support groups, which are important. And I would advise all of you to go check it out at NAMIDE.org. We have different support groups, um, mm -hmm. including a Sharing Hope Community Conversations. Um, it's a virtual one that I do at the last mm -hmm. Thursday of each month, the fourth Thursday of each month, where we talk about different topics, but specifically through the lens of being in the Black community, because they're just certain things, you know, where you just need to be in a certain group to, because you have the same like shared experiences about those things and you talk about it the same way. Um, so we have those conversations. And then we also offer some really great courses as well. Um, I'm gearing up to teach another uh, family to family coming up and that's a seven, seven to eight week, depending on if it's virtual or in person course. And it really breaks down, not just like the knowledge of the different mental illnesses, but like, how to communicate with that person, how to deal with problem resolution, how to deal with getting help if you need to, how to interact with law enforcement if you have to. Like it really breaks it down so anybody who is touched by somebody who is dealing with it can have a better understanding, not just of what they're going through, but also how they can, how they can work through it. And you know, Apostle, a lot of people get their support through, through, through the church. I mean, for example, the, the church may host uh, mental illness groups. Uh, the, the church may host, uh, and I know, I know quite a few churches that host uh, a &A groups, DNA groups. Absolutely. Uh, so talk, what, what role did the, the spirituality uh, play in regards to those who are recovering uh, from mental illnesses, even substance abuse as well? I, I, I'll answer your question, question like this. There was a situation that happened in my life that actually changed my entire view. Now, I didn't have a view that we didn't need uh, mental health, clinic help. We didn't need all of that. You know, we got God and we're good. But some things you learn when you're in the water. I was carjacked in, in uh, North Carolina. The young man that carjacked me, I stopped him from taking the car. We ran headlong into a BP gas station. In one hour, I held this boy's hand and I told him, son, look at me, don't do this with your life. Then the car crashed into the BP building. In one hour, that 27 year old kid died. Mm. Now, of course the police came and all of that. They picked me up, I, I was cut up and everything. When me, we, when me and my wife were getting ready to drive another vehicle to continue on, you know, this minister is going to keep my own rolling. So they're going to keep my car. They impounded my car for the police investigation. I got another rental car and off to ministry on that trip. I kept going. Listen at this. You're, you're going to love this as far as an example. I stopped at a gas station to put gas in the car. Mm -hmm. Some young boys drove up right beside the gas tank, did nothing. They were getting gas. I took the gas a handle, put it back in on the sta on the stand, got in the car, and my wife was saying, Ivory, Ivory, you didn't put gas in the car. I said, Evelyn, let's go now. And it was like weird. I actually kept going over top of the trauma. Less than a month or two later. When I say I crashed and burned, ladies, I mm -hmm. crashed and burned, started drinking, didn't make no sense. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going to see a counselor. And I love the way she handled me. Mm -hmm. I sat in her office totally disarmed. And I said, I don't understand this. Now, I came from drug addiction and alcohol. What happened to me when the trauma hit me? 
I went back to the comfort zone. Yeah. When I went in her office, it was beautiful the way she handled me. I said, I don't understand this. I love God. I help people. I said, how could I go back to the same thing I used to do? I said, it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And the woman looked at me so sweet. And she said, don't you think after all the help you've done for others, you need to get some for yourself? That carjacking, the pain from it, the trauma from it, opened up stuff that was already there. Mm -hmm. And the counseling that I had to go to and the process that I had to go through gave me a healthy respect for mental health counseling. Are you following me? I kept that with me. I embraced that, took it back to our ministry. By me being an overseer, I took it back to our ministry to make them aware, the ministers that were under me, that we need to understand when we're dealing in an area that we're not familiar with. And we were not familiar with how, how to deal with the mental health issues in our church. The counselor needed counseling and it made him understand. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah. That was the journey that brought me to that. And guess what? <laughs> it was one of the best eye-opening, hurtful experiences I ever had in my life, but it changed me for the better. Yeah. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that story. I mean, it was powerful and you know, I don't I don't want to minimize it, but I'll say what you shared is so common when it comes to yes. acute trauma. You know, I mean, that was pretty much the after effect of what you had experienced. And you're human. You know, we are human beings living the human experience. So when people try to put us in these boxes and subcultures, oh, we're black, we're female, we're we're LGBTQIA plus. <laughs> The fact is, is that we're all human beings living a human experience. Exactly. Don't put us in these boxes because all of us are susceptible to experiencing some incident, some event in life that's going to test our resiliency, our strength. We're all we're all vulnerable to that. Yeah, Latanya, and it doesn't Latanya, matter who we are. It doesn't discriminate. Check this out, Latanya. In this journey where I was studying, keep, keeping it moving, right? I remember I was at a hotel giving a lecture and I was in a hot tub and the guy in the other guy that was in the hot tub with me was a police officer. Mm -hmm. And somehow we got to talking and he said, I told him what happened. And he said, the boy died. I said, yes. He said, you just went through that experience. He said, how did you handle it? And I said, praise God, the Lord, you know, you know, I, Praise God, the Lord, the, the Lord just kept me. And he looked at me and he said, you know, when we run into something that heavy, we have to go to counseling and we have to get help. It was right there all along. The mm -hmm. voice, here he was, me, the minister, him, the police officer, but we needed the same thing. And he had already caught up with what the, the revelation I was about to experience. The need of mental health counseling. That's right. I have to say, I especially love that coming from, from you, a pastor, because it is so hard, um, especially in our community, right? Like we have our faith and people think that faith should cure it all. Like if I pray, then I don't need the tools. And I think it's even more impactful and powerful when you have someone who has a ministry who says to go get help. Um, I'm currently on a mission to get as many uh, ministers trained in at least mental health first aid. So they at least know the basics when people come and talk to them. Um, because at the end of the day, therapy, a therapist can give you the tools, right? The tools that you need to get over certain things. And that's what I always tell people. Like, yes, you can vent to your friends, but A, do they have the capacity to take on your venting? And yes, you can pray and the Lord helps you, but like, do you know the tools to get over? Do you know how to stop and change directions with your thoughts and all those things? And you're not getting any of those unless you actually go to someone who's trained in it, which is a therapy, a therapist, but it doesn't mean that you have any less faith. Um, and it's sometimes that is sometimes the hardest hurdle. Right, right. 
You know, Lakeisha, you mentioned earlier about um, medications. Uh, let me give you a scenario. John Doe has been taking his medications for five years. He's been stable, been feeling great, work, got his own place, budgets his own finances, keeps his house clean and everything. So John Doe one day decides, you know what? I'm feeling much better. Oh. I'm stable. I don't think I need to take medications anymore. So talk about the significance <laughs> of those continues <laughs> taking medications because they're, 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 I, I, I see, I've seen stories like that, you know, working in this field. So, you know, there, there are those who get so comfortable that, and um, Mayande, if you want to mention that as well, if you want to comment on well, as well, you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak okay, after because I was John Doe. So after oh, Lakeisha, oh, I'll, I'll give you some personal oh, 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 experience. Oh, ahead, Lakeisha, this is about to get juicy now. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because I also was, um, I was Jane Doe number two. And, oh, you know, uh -oh, okay. Initially, even as a healthcare provider, and sometimes the best, the best practice, and I tell my patients, I'm so transparent. I don't mind sharing my story. I'm unbothered, I'm unshamed about what I've went through because I know that my story will help someone. But initially, because it's, it's like once you once you're diagnosed, whether it's something medical, whether it's mm. something that is mental health, that's life altering. That sends you through what we call the stages of because now you're having to make this major adjustment, mm. and you literally do you go through the steps of uh, three. First step, you go you in denial, disbelief, shock, you numb. This is not me, and Literally, I had to learn my compliance with my medication was what was making me better. I mm -hmm. prayed, I fast, I didn't stop those things. I added therapy and medication. And I was done. Therapy really, really won for over everything else. Therapy really over it, it won. But also I knew that the medication was needed because there are some of us who produce in our brain, we produce too many, too much hormones, certain hormones, serotonin, or epinephrine, dopamine, GABA. These are what the, most of your mental health medication target, neurotransmitters. And I had to learn study even before for myself that I needed that and it was okay for me not to be okay it was okay for me to be compliant with my medication because my medication was actually blocking because I was making too much of something in the brain a certain hormone in the brain so or either you can make too little of something and you, your, your brain needs help to stimulate it and that's one other thing, and it's so important that you don't only just take care of yourself mentally, but also physically. But I was in denial. My aunt is here now, and they can there. She can actually verify um, the intervention that my family had to have, and it was after being assaulted physically on the job and attempted sexually assaulted by a veteran on the job, my patient. And then I also that same month went through the loss of my first baby. Mm. And all of that I held in as the, elf, the typical the, the typical black woman. You know, we are strong, we were aggressive. You know, sometimes we misunderstood, you know, because we're so um, assertive. Our assertiveness is, is in, for some people are in, um, interpreted as um, aggressive or just mean, nasty, get them, you know, and things of that nature. But you have to take your medication, guys. John Doe was feeling better because he had stabilized on his medication. And mm -hmm. once you stop your medication, you will begin to unravel. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of time. And it is very important that you do not self-medicate yourself or make adjustments to your medication or borrow someone else's or take someone else's medication because when you look at the body there are different pharmacokinetics 
pharmacal dynamics when it comes to these medications, mental health wise. And I can promise you, I used to tell a lot of my youth because I love the youth. I would tell them, if you please do not tell me a story if you're not exhibiting this, because if we administer this medication to you for so long, if you don't have mental health issues, probably more than likely it will when you start this medication. And I would stress even to my adults, please be honest. You, please be honest, open, transparent with your providers. Let them know how the medication is making you feel. Do not stop your medication. Mental health medication can cause a very serious adverse effect to include death at the top. Because you can have certain arrhythmias in your heart. Meaning your heart is not functioning regularly like it should. And it will overwork and stop. Or you can pro proceed and cause yourself to have a seizure. So it is very important, guys. I can't stress that enough. Even with myself, I had to take the medication to see. And, and as I went to counseling, I started finding myself unraveling. I would go into the state of depression off days, not wanting to get out of bed, not wanting to bathe. When do you, a woman should never not want to bathe, but depression will have you in a place that you won't even care about your hygiene. It will have you in a place where you in this black hole that you feel you are better off dead than here on earth. It will have you in a place to make you feel at your lowest, low self-esteem. And John Doe should not. All right. Oh, you want me? He should have this conversation with his provider and allow the provider to they collaborate together to make the decision if he has a counselor, bring the counselor in as an interdisciplinary team to collaborate together and develop a plan that best fits him in his situation circumstances. But right. it does right. not happen like that. Mm -hmm. All right, but let, let me go to the other Okay. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, let, let me go to the uh, other uh, uh, Yes. So, um, as I mentioned, I've been John Doe, Jane Doe. Um, let me first start by saying, though, so I live with depression and anxiety, um, but I have clinical depression. And it's really important for people to understand the difference between like situational depression and clinical depression, which I didn't understand for the longest time, which I think made it harder for me to deal with. Because like it says, situational depression, it's linked to a situation. Someone passed away, you lost your job broke up with someone, you're going through something and that has led you to either being sad for a period of time or prolonged depression. Clinical depression, I can go to sleep feeling fine and wake up feeling like I'm drowning and wake up feeling like everything's just crashing in and coming to like this horrible place. Um, and so why it's important to, to note that is even your example earlier of like the football player who's doing all the great things, like that was me in high school. You know, I was in the AP classes, leading the clubs, doing the sports, doing musicals, teaching Sunday school, doing stuff with church. Um, and then I was also like crying myself to sleep at night. You know, nobody would ever know because I was fully functioning. I was like on paper that girl, but I was so in this dark place that I didn't know how to explain it because how do you say, well, nothing's wrong with my life, but I feel awful. I, I think it's even harder sometimes for people going through clinical depressions to have those conversations because if you don't have a specific thing that's sort of triggering that it's like well what do you have to be sad about and we see it all the times like i'm on social media a lot so i see a lot in the comment section i'm sure we hear it from family members like you don't even know what real problems are like well sometimes life is just a real problem just existing is a real problem for me right now because of how my brain is set up um so after um i like left college I did go to a therapist for a little while and got on some education, with my doctor. And then I was like, okay, I'm doing good. I'm great. Like, I don't need this anymore because duh, I'm 
so strong mentally. I don't need medication. Of course not. Um, I thought, you know, I, I figured it out. I'm on the plan. I'm in the sunshine. I'm doing all the things. I'm fine. And I was fine for a little while. And then it started to like come back again. And so I finally really had to get to the point where A, I acknowledge I had clinical depression. I actually had to do a whole um, study and testing with that. Um, and then realize that as much as we kind of stigmatize medication for mental health, it really shouldn't be. Um, I have asthma and nobody ever tells me that I should say, oh, lungs, just work a little harder. You don't need that inhaler, just, just work a little harder. And I think because when we talk about mental health and mental illness, we always equate it to feelings. Like I'm feeling down, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling all these things. So then we think, just change how you feel, just work like maneuver that to feel better do these things to feel better but your mental health and mental illness is attached to an organ your brain your actual brain which functions or doesn't function as it's supposed to kind of like Lakeisha said so for me because I have clinical depression it's because my brain isn't firing off a chemical that I need it to to keep me feeling like oh everything's okay which is why even when everything is wonderful I can feel like just existing is awful it's because that those chemicals that I need have dropped down so low it's the equation it's like the equivalent of my brain having a asthma attack right mm -hmm. so just like I need my inhaler to help me I need my medication to help keep my brain functioning at the level and to help keep it pumping those horm hormones or chemicals that I need to keep me, you know, happy-ish for the most part. Um, so it's really important for people to have those conversations, again, circling back to why you need therapists, because they will also have those conversations because some people are on medication forever and some people are on it for a short period of time because they are going through a situational depression, a situational instance where they need it for this little bit of time but even then your doctor will onboard you and offboard you because that's very important like I've never had a doctor say okay just start taking this it's like all right take half of this for a couple of days then one then like they will onboard you and offboard you and that is super important but um, I can't express enough how it is okay to use medication if you need it because it is an organ and your organ sometimes needs that additional help. Just you wouldn't make any other organ suffer. So don't make your brain suffer. I, I, I am just enjoying all of the stories here. You know, by me being a therapist, I sit in an office for an hour, eight ten, to 10 times a day, just <laughs> listening to people. And, you know, you all are just hitting the nail on the head. And I'm so glad we're having this conversation Nimade, you, you know, putting your, your story out there, sharing your personal experience, you're absolutely right. You know, depression and anxiety in the mental health world, we look at it as the cough and cold of mental health. We all will experience it at some point. There is not one person on this earth who can say that they've never felt depressed or anxious, but there's a difference between, like you said, the situational depression or maybe the social anxiety or public speaking anxiety versus the clinical depression. And we have to understand that our brain, that two pounds here is the strongest organ in our body. And if the brain is weak, the, the, the body will be weak. You know, our head is connected to our body. So why wouldn't you expect that if your brain is not functioning properly, that your body won't function properly and, and vice versa. But everything you said, just as far as the medications, I mean, you know, we've come so far in mental health. You know, like I said, I started in this field. I've known Omar for as long as I've been working in this field. And what, where we are today is not where we were back in 1998, 2000, Omar. You know that. And mm -hmm. we have brain scans. We have DNA testing. We have, you know, support groups. We have peer specialists. We have professionals now. There's so many so many avenues to address our, 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 you know, any, any hardships we have in life. There's really no excuse. It's us standing in our own way, honestly, because there's so many different ways that we can get the help that we need. And that's why this conversation is important because we want to let people know that you, it's okay to not be okay. And there's support out there for you. And there's a variety of supports because we all are susceptible to feeling, uh, you know, not like ourselves at some point in life. We're human. That's just that, that we're all susceptible to experiencing that.
I was getting ready to say something to you, Latoya. The work that I do, I'm on a quest to get ministry ministers to push back against the taboos that are really false taboos about the medication is not your enemy. The counselor that is not a uh, clergy is not the boogeyman. That that the need for this type of help, uh, seeing it in our families. I mean, when I sat on the other side of my congregation and I see a family four generations deep with uh, an addiction or or our, our, our mental health issues where nervous breakdowns or that type of thing is operating, I, I want to bring them to the place where the clergy can say, this is not my field here and go get the help. Now, this is a hard thing because most, some ministries, some ministries, I'm gonna put it like that, feel that they have right in house everything it needs to help their people. And I find that that is not true. At the same time, no one ever has a baby in my church and, and we have prenatal care right there and they have the child right there. And you know, between the 11th and 12th pew. So if we are not doing that and we can trust the medical field, we need to learn to trust the medical field in the areas of mental health that is not denying anything spiritually. It's just whole health care, total man, spirit, soul, and body. So if you were to say something to us, clergy, what mm -hmm. would you say to us, clergy, about reaching out to that congregation? So what I would say is that you don't wait until your teeth fall out to go see a dentist. You don't wait until you have some sort of medical crisis to see your doctor. If you, you know, see a dentist every six months for a cleaning, if you see your primary care doctor annually for a physical, why not consider a checkup from the neck up? We all need that. That, if I can put it simply, that's, that's the easiest way to put it is that we all need to check up from the neck up. And I'll, I'll share this from a personal uh, experience, is that I grew up in a very strict Pentecostal holiness church. We I never did. talked about mental health. We were told to pray it away. I thank God that God has blessed me with the ability to understand that we need prayer and professional help. PMP, prayer and professional help. They go hand in hand. Just like you said, you use the example of the prenatal care. You know, mm -hmm. God has gifted us with abilities to be able to uh, 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 treat and help people in the way that, you know, we can do it collectively. Yes. The problem is, and I'll be, I'll keep it more with you. The problem is, is that the clergy has a martyr complex. You know, you have to be the one to take on the burden, the pain. You got to help everybody. No, we need to be more yeah. humble and we need to accept that we are not the one-stop shop. The church is not the one-stop shop. We need to work with doctors, with medical providers, with the community. We have to do that outreach in order to really treat people in the way that they need to. There is no pastor. There is no, no, no deacon, no minister. We're not the saviors. We need to get that out of our, out of our heads and um, need to now start to accept that we need help from others. Yes. Period. All right. Okay. Uh, Troy, I want to stay with you. Uh, we got about, Thank you. About, about 25 minutes left. So I want to try to get as much in as possible. Um, one of the things that we didn't touch on was the suicide uh, about, about, about a month ago, uh, performing artist Twitch that committed suicide and people were surprised and, he, and, and we're not sure, you know, apparently I guess he was struggling with, with, with some symptoms. So if you can identify what, what are the, the warning signs of someone who may have suicidal thoughts? And, and then my second question for, for you, Latoya, and Apostle may want to answer this as well. And uh, this, this question came uh, about, about maybe about five, six months ago. And the first time I heard this question, you know, you, you have something what's called co-occurring disorder. You have someone who suffers from substance abuse and mental health. Um, so when we're treating a client who, who is struggling with substance abuse and mental health, 
<laughs> which, which do you treat first? Do you treat the substance abuse first or do you treat the mental, the mental health first? That, that was an interesting question that, that, that I had, if, if that question makes sense. So uh, it's all you. It's all you, Toya. Okay, I'll start with the co-occurring disorder piece. So, you know, the, the way we need to look at mental health and addictions now, we can't treat it separately. You know, we have to look at them as one in the same. 80% of people who use substances have an underlying mental disorder. So when people say, what came first, the drug addiction or the mental disorder? It really is the state of the brain. So I think it was Lakeisha that talked about the serotonin, norepinephrine, the dopamine, all those chemical imbalances that happen. What happens is, is that when we come from a family history of depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, what that means is that our, we come into this world with our brain being in a state that's not able to produce enough of those feel good chemicals, okay? So we don't have the, the level of dopamine that we need, the level of serotonin. So we probably come into the world with this much of it. So what happens is, is that when a person uses drugs and alcohol, it gives them a surge of those feel good chemicals. So what happens to the brain? The brain creates a homeostasis, meaning that, okay, well, you know what? You don't need me to do anything. You got all your dopamine from the drugs, from the alcohol, then maybe I don't need to produce as much. So what happens is, is that that person now needs to use more and more and more to feel functional, okay? So that's how we have to look at the, the, the brain. It's the state of it. And if a person it comes from a family where they have mental disorders, this is what we say, okay? So this is another saying, genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger, okay? So you have the genetic predisposition, but then you have those environmental factors that will really prime the brain and send that person over the edge to say, you know what, my brain just, you know, now, now that person is looking really dysfunctional and that's where you see those disorders come to a head. So we can't look at it as being drug addiction or mental illness. These are behavioral health issues. This is a behavioral health disorder, not one or the other. We got to look at them one and the same, and we have to treat them concurrently. And uh, what is the song? Oh, go ahead, boss. Go ahead, boss. No, no. I, all I was saying was, excellent. look, I'm feeding, I'm learning, I'm embracing, and what have you. I mean, I love it. Genetic leads the, what is it? Genetic loads the, the gun and the environment pulls the trigger? Mm -hmm. Is that how you said that? Yeah, I love that. Oh, oh did you froze. pause? Did, 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 did she oh, shut down? Oh, oh my God. God, Latoya, I hope you didn't lock down. Oh my goodness. Girl, well, I'm going to tell you right now, when she said that, Latoya, you're back. Oh. I'm here. I'm sorry. My internet went out for a sec. Oh, I girl, don't you leave like that. <laughs> don't leave me. Not don't like down. that. <laughs> Latoya, what was it say? Genetic loads the gun and, and the, the environment, environment pulls the trigger. Listen, when I heard you say that, just looking at Twitch's life, and we don't know the full dynamics of That's what right. happened, mm -hmm. but I will say this much. Look at the social mentality of a trauma that has happened right in our faces, and many people are traumatizing his family, his mm -hmm. children. Now, mm -hmm. as, a, as a counselor and a minister, I'm sitting here going like, guys, you know, we, we someone goes through uh, feelings of, so, of wanting to commit suicide. And I'm not going in there going like, well, you do know if you do it, you're going to hell. My goodness, it's already in hell. The hell of trying to be able to cope right. with the circumstance. So that's yeah. the last way I would go in. You know, going in, I will go in from a place of trying to let them voice where they're at so I can check my job, direct them into the direction to get some help. And and while telling them, it's okay to go there. It's okay to get that help. Matter of fact, grab my arm. I'll go there with you. Rather than, listen, what she expressed and knows I don't know. I have a, an influence that may, the person may come to me right. 
because right. of that dynamic of the pulpit and that hope and faith and 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 spirituality. But I have to know where my place stops, right? Or leads limits. We all have limits, you know. That's I know it. my friends. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. Exactly. And we have to be honest with ourselves. Yeah. Because if we if we don't know our limits, then we're limiting other people. We're limiting the people that yes. we're seeking to help. And yeah, that's like, what I find, not just in clergy. I mean, I find that across the board with, with mm -hmm. all sorts of people. We have to be honest that we don't know it all. We all yes. got something. We all got hurts, habits, and hang-ups. We all got limitations. All of us. So just, just be honest with who we are. And then go from there. But a lot yeah. of people in hunting professions, unfortunately, don't have that level of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. If right. we're going to help other people, be aware of your own limits, your own flaws, your own hurts, habits, exactly. and hang-ups. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I and I, I wanted to add. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to add a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, one, because you took it back to the to the clergy, I was going to let my example go, but something like you said, it's important to know your limits and to get help from others. Um, an example that I always try to use, and um, Reverend Hopkins, or I'm not sure if it's Reverend or Pastor, I'm definitely going to link up with this you because I'm on that same quest of mental health and and religion. And an example I always give is like one of my favorite stories is there's a man who's like drowning from a flood or he's in a flood and you know, someone comes along with a boat and he's like, yes. oh no, I'm good, God has got me. And then someone comes with a plane yes. and he's like, no, I'm good, God has got me. Then he gets to heaven and he's like, God, what happened? God's like, I sent you a boat, I sent you a plane. And I think it's really important for us always to remember that God's help doesn't always come in the form of like a voice from on high or maybe even from the pulpit. Like sometimes it comes from the therapist and he's sending you that as a tool. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to mention also, you know, we talked a little bit about substance and it's hard because I feel like a lot of times it's so much more acceptable, right, to use substances than it is to use mental health medication. Yes, if yes. like a teenage guy who's going through it says, I smoke weed every day because it makes me feel good. Everyone's like, mm -hmm. sounds about right. But if he was like, well, I take, you know, Lexapro to help my mental illness, people would be like, whoa, that's whoa. weird. Yeah. But a lot of times the reason they're doing those substances is because, you know, like I said, I was crying every night, not having any clue why. Um, so a lot of times people are taking those things to sort of help them get through those points. And then that leads to the substance abuse. And now it's this whole bigger cycle. Um, and even sometimes with the struggling of it on your own, you, you know, we were talking about Twitch, which was very, Twitch is very rough for me because I have been a fan of his since his So You Think You Can Dance Absolutely. days. Yes. So it's like one of those things where like, you don't know him, but also I've known him for 14 years. And it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard mm -hmm. facing a loss like that, especially when you see someone so jovial and so happy. And I think that we naturally want to say always, that depression looks a certain way. And we yeah. talked about it. We talked about some of those symptoms. Um, Lakeisha Latoya gave us those symptoms of withdrawal, the sad. And yes, that's part of it. But there's also people who are very good at masking. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I talked about last year was really one of the roughest years I've had in a while to the point where I was close to that edge as well in July, just because I had been dealing with so much, like so many deaths in the family, physical things, mental, like it was a lot and I was done. Um, thankfully, still here. Um, I worked my way through it, but it was incredibly difficult. And I think that, you know, A, nobody would necessarily know because A, I retreat a little bit. Like I was dealing with my therapist. We were talking, I was doing the things I needed to. But like, if you go to my Instagram page, it's like, oh, she's doing interviews. She's doing all those things. But like, no one knows that there were days where I had to sit in bed and be like, just put a smile on for 30 minutes. You just got to sit through 30 minutes to do that interview and then you can come back to bed and I would do it I'd get on camera smile through an interview and then go back to bed you never know what people are dealing with by what they show on the outside and a lot of times people on the outside especially those of us who deal with hurt and pain or whatever we don't want to talk about it because we don't want to bring other people down because people naturally feel like they should be able to fix it and if I know you can't fix it like why am I putting my problems on you so sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard for people to put their problems on others mm -hmm. um, but when they reach that point it just always breaks my heart when mm -hmm. I see comments like oh it's so selfish of them oh they should have been stronger and it's like mm -hmm. you don't know what it's like to feel that drowning feeling 
and get up every day and do it over and over and over. Like I said, by July, I was like, I cannot do this anymore. Like I, that drowning, trying to just catch my breath every day was like, I was exhausted. And I can't speak to everybody who goes through that or what it feels like on their end. But for a lot of us, it's really, it's that point of just not being able to take it anymore. It's not about wanting to be selfish or not caring. It's like, I just physically cannot take, I can't bear this burden anymore. And it's hard and it's, you know, they think about their family, um, but sometimes that's not enough to get you through it, depending on how long you've been struggling. So it's really important for people, you know, as they look for those signs to also recognize, and that's where the whole check on your strong friends things come on. Cause sometimes it is your happy friends who seem to, you know, be doing fine. Like just ask them how it's going and have a conversation with them because you never know. Or that friend who's doing a lot of substances, maybe it's because they don't know that they have clinical depression and they're trying to just weed their way through happiness. So, you know, it comes in all different forms. It's, that's one of the hardest things about mental health and mental illness is like, there is no one size fits all. There's no one answer to everything. Everyone deals with everything a different way. Everyone deals with everything from their own perspectives. You just have to, just have compassion at the end of the day, just have compassion, lead with compassion, and you'll usually find the right path. All right, for two, for two or two or three minutes, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna come back, I'll be back with you, Fox, but for two or three minutes, uh, Lakeisha, you, you said something that's very significant. You, you admitted on this panel that, that, that you had a mental health disorder. And I, I think that's where it starts because sometimes some people are in denial, they, they don't acknowledge or believe that they have a mental illness. So for about two or three minutes, just talk about the significance of why it's important that, that you acknowledge and admit that you do have a mental health disorder and there's nothing wrong with it. About two or three minutes, please. If you never admit that you are having an issue, you will never seek treatment. You will never accept treatment. You will never even receive treatment. And in the end, it's a lot that can be missed out of life because literally time doesn't stop for any of us. And there is a time lap with um, just holding back, you guys. Every day is a struggle for me. I war in my mind every single day. But with the my with therapy, with my coping skills, with applying them, I can't just receive. My therapist just can't give me the, the tools and I don't use them. I work every single day, you know? Then I have to remind my Pentecostal patient, faith, faith without work is dead. <laughs> and if you don't work, if you don't yeah. use the tools that you've been given, it's, you're, you're never going to be able to know if it really works or not. I'm telling you, you are uncomfortable. When you go to mental health treatment and care and medication, get ready for your uncomfortable to be your new. All right. Okay, Apostle, I'll let anyone else as we close now. This great discussion. I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to share something and, and real, real quick. In mental health issue, in a case that I had during the, one of the times that I had to go in for counseling, my body started sending me messages. Uh, the, my nervous system, my dream. Now, check this out, uh, uh, Latoya. During the time when the depression was hitting me and I was losing it, I have this dream of being down Ocean City, Maryland. There's this great big Ferris wheel as mm -hmm. you go in. Mm -hmm. And when at this Ferris wheel, I'm on, I get on the Ferris wheel and I'm going around and I say to the guy at the bottom, let me off. And he wouldn't let me off. Mm -hmm. And in the dream, in my emotions, I begin to stream, let me off. In my natural state, when I woke up, that was the way that I was beginning to, I wanted to get off and couldn't stop. Yeah. And my wife said to me, she, she wanted to do everything she could. She was nice, she was patient, she was kind, but I couldn't get off. I was on this merry-go-round and I couldn't get her off. And the counselor that worked with me helped me actually get off that thing. But my body, so I say to people, this I'm trying to say, not being all spooky, but your body will talk to you. Yeah. Your nervous system, your whole system will talk to you. 
in that condition, my sleep was not rest, but I was sleep for hours, but woke up as if I had been beat up. I just wanted to share that, 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 that so for some people to know that when you're going through these mental health issues like this, you're going to have odd feelings and listen to your body. It's talking to you. Listen to your, your, your mind, the way you're grasping and thinking about yourself. It's talking to you. That's all I had to say. All right, so I'm going to each one of you an opportunity to close out uh, your respective organizations, uh, books that you wrote. You want to have those who are watching how to get in contact with you. Um, Miss N, I want to mention your name up again. Uh, with NAMI Delaware, if you can leave the, the times, the days, the support groups, uh, the number to NAMI, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, again, my name is Nimari Beiru. Thank you uh, so much for having me on Omar to talk about this. It's a really important topic. Uh, as I mentioned, I have a fellowship with NAMI Delaware and the Diversity and Equity Fellow. So you can always reach me if you want to email me at engage at NAMIDE.org. I'm also like all over social media, especially on Instagram um, at that African butterfly. Um, so if you ever need to connect with me, you can reach out with me, reach out to me through that. Um, NAMIDE.org is the website where you can go and you can learn all about the different uh, support groups that we offer. Um, we do them for different ethnicities, um, different groups of people, family, friends. Uh, as I also mentioned, um, I do Sharing Hope Community Conversation, uh, which is usually the last or the fourth Thursday of each month. I normally try to have like a guest therapist and um, some people with lived experiences to talk as well as having the group conversation. Uh, so hopefully you will join us for that. And then my last word, like I mentioned a few minutes ago though, is just to really practice being compassionate and kind with others. Um, at the end of the day, if you make kindness your default, um, it's, it's a lot better than wondering what if when you're mean to someone who was on there, their, you never know how close to the edge somebody is. And at the end of the day, you'd rather err on the side of being kind to them than not and regretting it later. Okay, Lakeisha, your book, how can people contact you to get to purchase your book? Oh, wow. Um, you guys actually can contact me. You can follow me. My page is actually my name. And I do also, and I, I, do, I, I, I have to get used to this to let you guys know that I also have a nonprofit organization for mental health as well as on um, physical health. And it's called CPR International. And I also have a page for that group for that on Facebook that you can actually go and follow. Um, you actually can go purchase the book from Amazon. It's available on Amazon. Oh, did she freeze on us? Yes, it's okay. her, her book is okay. on Amazon.com. Okay. All right. All right, let's show you your practice. Um uh, your website yeah, okay so before i start with that i just want to i got to go back i'm sorry i, I was well there, well. taking notes oh. as a, uh mr yeah. Hall speaking. <laughs> so the, if i were to interpret your dream it sounds like there was some sort of powerlessness that was going on there you know kind of like the hamster on the wheel where you just yeah. felt like you just didn't see an end to a means to the end so anyway what i'll say too is that our body has two brains, one in here and then one in our gut. We're going to feel it somewhere. Either we're going to, it's going to be up here, it's going to be in our body, one or the other. But we have to listen to our, our body. We have to listen to our mind and, um, you know, act uh, accordingly. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, the other thing I want to mention, too, is that when we talk about Genetics and environment, those are the two main contributing factors to mental illness and substance use disorders. So there's a thing, if you all aren't familiar with it, I would say Google ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Okay, so Adverse Childhood Experiences are 10 questions that are markers that will put a person at higher risk for developing mental disorders, hypersexuality, obesity, diabetes, suicide, you, you name it, it's, it's in there. But the reason why I say that is because there are protective factors. We are not victims, we are not oppressed. Yes, we do have maybe that background, that family history, but there are ways to prevent it. There are ways to combat it. And if we can prevent our children, our grandchildren, and next generation, ourselves even, 
from experiencing these adverse childhood experiences, then that gives us a greater chance at fighting against the genetic predispositions. Okay, the other thing I wanna say is that NAMI is just not specific to Delaware. It is a national alliance of mental illness. I, I work closely with NAMI here in Maryland, but I just wanted to say that, that they are national. They do a lot of great advocacy work. We're at uh, cap, uh, legislative days. They do amazing work. So I just wanted to shout out uh, Nimade. Thank you for and, that. And, yes, because I, I get yeah, very Delaware. So, NAMI, but we could, are could you still yes. NAMI? How, how is it? I hear the pronunciation. Is, uh, it's, it's N-A-M-I. Okay. National exactly Alliance what I Mental Illness. Mm -hmm. All right, real quick, Lakeisha, uh, what's your resume? Okay, I didn't, I didn't uh, give my contact information. Uh, I apologize. Yes. Yes. Okay, so if you want to reach me, uh, my phone number is 443-529-8914. The name of my practice is Work Life Behavioral Health and Professional Training. So not only do we do therapy, we do psychiatric medications. Uh, we also train um, social workers, therapists, drug and alcohol counselors nationally. We're also a, 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 an accredited training entity. Um, we also do speaking engagements. If you ever have a group or any church function, community function, uh, please let me know. I'd be more than willing to come out and speak to your group. Um, and, and my email address, uh, personal email address is Latoya, L-A-T-O-Y-A, the number four, Maryland, spelled out M A R Y L A N D um, at gmail.com. Uh, Lakeisha, real quick, what, what, what's, what's the uh, website for your nonprofit organization or, or the phone it number? Is w okay, it is www.cprinternational.org. Okay. And contact number. Contact e via email would be best and that will be CPR ministry 2021 at gmail.com. All right, Apostle, close this out. <laughs> well, as I said, my name is Ivory Hopkins and uh, you can just about Google me everywhere, but we, we are pilgrimsministry.org. And if someone wanted to contact us, it would be ihopkins828 at gmail.com. Um, and um, and we've been just delighted to just talk and see which way directions go. I'm really, I'll be honest with you tonight, I'm having a, a learning and a gleaming moment. I cannot express to you all, this has been amazing. You know, uh, Lakeisha and I are, are very, really very, nice. very close. And we are kind of working in the spirit filled Pentecostal anointed gifted realm of yeah. convincing that mental health aid and and all of this is not the devil, it's not the enemy, yeah. uh, you know, it is a aid that God has given us. So that's a quest that we are on. I just have a large uh, public uh, viewing uh, with the work that I have been doing for 45 years. And so we're kind of, I'm kind of really kicking against an elephant right now in mm -hmm. some of the areas, arenas where I am known it. And so this is, it's a passion for me now. Sometimes what breaks you helps make you and change you. And that's what that crash did for me. Mm. All right, everybody. Thanks yeah. again for, for coming out and being guests this evening. It was a wonderful show. And I'm quite sure in the future shows, I will have you all on uh, from one point or another. But thank you all. Have a blessed week. Happy New Year. God bless. We'll keep you and, all uh, in mind. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And it was so nice meeting all of you. Don't be surprised if you get an email from me asking you to be on community conversations. So I'd love to speak with all of you again. Yes. <laughs> all right. All thank you all. Have a have a Thanks, blessed day. Well. Right. Thank you, Omar. Yes. Right. Thank you all. Thank you, Omar. Love you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Thank you all. Stay blessed.